All right. Welcome back to episode four of the Playmakers Podcast with Neff and Topher. Uh, today's date is Monday, February 15th. And today we're going to be talking about stuff in the NBA with the Nuggets. We're going to talk a little bit about college hoops, uh, big moves and free agency in the offseason in the NFL. And Topher is going to get his crack at lacrosse this week. Finally here, everybody. Lacrosse is coming. This is a lacrosse-friendly program. I, I say let's kick it off here. The big news in the NBA last night, uh, the Nuggets crushed the Lakers like by 20 points. I don't have the exact score on, off the top of my head. But the big news was first half, Anthony Davis, he's coming off an injury. He has to come out of the game in the second half. He was strained his Achilles. Um, who knows what's going to happen? Going forward, there's still a lot unknown about this injury, uh, but he has an MRI coming. Uh, he's been questionable for a few weeks, so it looks like the Robin to LeBron's Batman in Los Angeles could be out for significant time. What does this do for the title chase for the Lakers and the NBA as a whole? I don't know. I think they should. I think they should rest Anthony Davis because he. I don't want to. I don't want to angry, anger people. But uh, I think Anthony Davis was the MVP of that team last year. It wasn't LeBron. Except for in the finals. Like, LeBron came alive in the finals. But Anthony Davis really just put himself on the line for that championship. And I'm – kudos to him because without, without Anthony Davis, LeBron James is not – well. Well, he's still LeBron, but – they LeBron. probably don't. They don't win a championship without Anthony Davis. They don't win a championship without Batman, without Robin. Of course. So they have to do whatever they can to protect him for the playoffs, right? Mm hmm. So it's weird with Achilles injuries like this. This is a very sensitive injury. Uh, like when you've got tendonitis or strain down in your Achilles, like the risk of that popping, if, if that pops, he could be out for up to two years. This is a long-term injury risk. So they definitely shouldn't play him unless they need him, really, the rest of the regular season, unless it's just a minor injury in two weeks' time, right? I have the final score. It's 122 to 105. Yeah, so they got beat fairly handily by Jokic and the Nuggets there. But, like, you can look, you can afford losing some games in the regular season if you can get Anthony Davis back for the playoffs. Like, let's say they keep losing some games. They slip to, like, fourth or third in the West without Anthony Davis. Does that matter? I don't think so. Because if they're healthy in the playoffs, they're still the best team in the conference. Most likely. They'll still make a run. They'll still cause havoc. They have just a good shot. So, really, if they can – if they can, if they know that they can get him back for the playoffs, they can afford to let him sit for a while. Mm -hmm. But let's say it's a more serious injury and he's out for the whole year. What do you see happening then? I think they'll make it to – I think they'll win in the first round. Then maybe lose the next series. Maybe I'd say 42. 42, right? Yeah. So you, so you think they're – without Anthony Davis, their title chances are, are just gone? I don't think they're just, just gone because – I would never bet against LeBron James. Fair, uh, fair. And the Lakers organization. Mm -hmm. Being the Lakers organization. But that's a huge blow. I, I saw I saw something, Stephen A, he, he said, the first, well, as soon as he heard about Anthony Davis' injury, he was like, who's going to stop the Nets now? You know? And I see some truth in that, because outside of LeBron and Anthony Davis, no one else has that cumul cumulative star power of... Uh, Brooklyn and a lot of times in the NBA star power can win out so I see where he's going with that but I'm not worried there are other good teams I mean I, th I think the team collective matters sometimes you know that's been kind of choking this year they yeah I mean we all know how James Harden plays in the playoffs right <laughs> yeah so it'll certainly be interesting to see how this affects things moving forward but outside of those two teams, neither of them, the Nets or the Lakers, have the best team or best record in the NBA. That belongs to the Utah Jazz. Yeah, the Utah Jazz with 
Donovan Mitchell and their big man with the five, Rudy Gobert. They have the best record in the league, 22 wins and five losses above the 21 and seven Lakers, which come next. Yeah, I know we talked about them a little bit last week, but they, they've continued to win, so we're going to continue to talk about them. Yeah, they are on a seven-game win streak, I believe. Um, here, I have it here. They're on a seven-game win streak, and they've won 18 of their last 19. That's insane. So they are on an absolute tear the last, like, two months here. Because Donovan Mitchell is averaging, what, 20? He's at 24 points. 24 points per game, uh, about four averages per game. Yeah, yeah, he's about four. He's 24 points, four assists, five rebounds. So he's he's playing at an all-star level, but he's not like he's MVP level. It's really the collective because you also have Jordan Clarkson who's up at like 17 a game, Mike Conley who's at like 16 and seven. So they have a whole lot of dudes, and they, they have a very team ethos. And then they got Rudy Gobert, like I said before, guarding Dominating the-, the defense. He's in almost three blocks a game. And it's paying out. They have the second best uh, points allowed per game, second best field goals allowed per game, or field goal percentage allowed. Uh, they're top five in blocks. So they got the lockdown D. And then on offense, they're top 10 in pretty much everything, like shooting wise, scoring, a top five in three point shooting. And they're also the best rebounding team, which I know Rudy Gobert also helps with it is yeah. big, his size, his penchant for grabbing boards. He's at almost 14 a game. Hey, but don't take Joe Ingles for granted. (laughs) Bro. The math teacher, Joe Ingles. The most casual looking guy in the NBA. Right? A certified sniper. You can't knock. You can't knock him when he's uh, uh, dropping 30 on you. Who they got as their backups? Uh, I just, I don't know that much about the team. I'm not exactly a... Utah Jazz fan over here, but I know I think Clarkson is their sixth man, and he's probably if he is rocking as a sixth man, he's certainly sixth man of the year. Then you got Bojan Bogdanovich; he's play, he's dropping fifteen a game. They oh, they got Mike Conley out right now. Is that a big injury? We'll see. Well, it doesn't say like a torn hamstring or anything, so it might just be a minor injury. But even with that, as I say, I've said a couple times already, is Jordan Clarkson, he's their second-leading scorer. You know, it's like a backup point guard, bench facilitator kind of role. They got all kinds of dudes making contributions. They got Derek Favors. That's another big dude. Big man making plays out there. Uh, I saw – I want to say there's another guy who's playing well on their team as well. Uh, you got off that bench, Royce O'Neal playing almost 20. I think he's playing 32 minutes a game. I think he's actually starting power forward there, but he's grabbing seven and seven in a complimentary role. So they got everyone on their roster. Their mm-hmm. stars, these kind of random role guys like an O'Neal, like a Jordan Clarkson. Everyone's playing well. I think we got to give Quinn Snyder a lot of credit for that. I think he's a Lou Williams caliber sixth man, Jordan Clarkson. But Jordan Clark with these stats, hell yeah. Absolutely. If you're going to play this well, hell yeah, you're a six man year Lou Williams caliber beast out there. But I mean, Lou Williams isn't even the best sixth man of all time because Jamal crossover Crawford, three times sixth man of the year winner, guaranteed bucket. So if you're one of those dudes on your team, that is unbelievably clutch. I know we talked about the Knicks. They have another, they have their, their rookie quickly. Yeah. He's another guy like that. Manuel. Yeah, he come off the bench, give grab you 16 in the most silky yeah. smooth fashion possible. See, see, you saw have a whole lot going for him, but a lot of people don't buy into it. Yeah, even I said I think this morning he is not into it right now. Do you buy it personally? Do you think the Utah Jazz are a real title contender? I mean. You saw how much fight they put up against the Nuggets last year in the bubble. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's different circumstances now, but still, like, they they have more of a chip on their shoulder to 
get back to where they were and better because Donovan Mitchell was playing at MVP level. Yeah, that series, he was incredible. I think both Jamal Murray and him dropped 50 twice. Oh, yeah. That duel between those two was ridiculous. I don't know if I've personally seen anything quite like that in a playoff series. Yeah. I I think I think Donovan Mitchell really um, he's got that that uh, Mamba mentality right now. Interesting. And the rest of the team is just well put together. So I mean, what what better than having someone who's on Mamba mentality right now, and then having a team that's all well knit together? A, a, a well built team. It's not like Brooklyn where it's like elite players just trying to work it out on the fly it's they have a team ethos and in the nba sometimes it's superstars just went out but i don't know i feel like utah have a good shout with such such a nice well-knit core if they keep playing this well Mm -hmm. they absolutely have a shot to make the play or of course they'll make playoffs but they have absolutely have a shot to make a title run especially and especially if anthony davis is hurt they might who knows they could easily make it out of the west the west yeah um, do you have anything else you want to share about the Utah Jazz? Uh, no, no. I think we covered it all. I think, I think they're, I think, I think they're going to go to the finals. They, wow, they bold, have, bold call, they have bold a call. Chance, they have a big chance of getting to very the good chance. I think I agree. I, I don't think that I don't. I'm not going to say they will, yeah. but especially if Anthony Davis is banged up down the stretch, I think they are certainly one of the two or three favorites from the West right now, unless they completely fall off, which you know we'll see. All right, so the NBA season, we are, I don't know exactly how far away are we in. Oh, my goodness. I don't know exactly how far we are into the season so far. Halfway through, actually. We're close to halfway point? All right, so it sounds to me like it's a perfect time to pick our all-star teams. Now, the all-star game itself is a little, the all-star game itself is a little sus. A lot of players don't like it, but we're still going to give the guys the award recognition they deserve. So what do you want to start, east or west? Let's start with the West. Let's start with yours. My West? Yes. All right. So for everyone listening, we are going to do our five starters from each conference plus three bench players just to give a little extra recognition. Um, All right. So I'll start with my team from the West. My back back court point guard from the Golden State Warriors, Stephen Curry. Oh, my goodness. The man's on a tear. He's back to his best making highlight play after highlight play, carrying a kind of bad clayless Warriors. Steph Curry, he's absolutely an all-star this year. Such a fun player to watch. Uh, And then my other guard from the very inconsistent and kind of trash Dallas Mavericks, Luka Doncic. I know his team's not playing well, but he's putting up almost a triple-double every game. He's a generational talent. He's on the trajectory to be an all-time great. He's coming for that throne, LeBron. You give him a good team around him, they're going to win title after title. So my other all-star starting guard from the Western Conference is Luka Doncic. And then I'll round out my front court. We got Kawhi Leonard of the Clippers and LeBron James of the Lakers. Easy picks for me. Best players on best teams. And then my center, Nikola Jokic. I think that's also an easy pick. He's been an MVP caliber player for Denver. You want to pick your starters out West now? Yeah, let's let's stick with the starters and then we'll go to the bench. Uh, I got to give... I got to give the point guard spot. Same thing. Topher, the golden boy, Chef Curry, Steph Curry himself. He is insane. So he, good. So good. Back to his shenanigans. Oh, my goodness. The league, honestly, the league is better when Steph is doing Steph things. It's just, it just is. I mean, it just brings me back to the good old days with the double bang from Mike Breen. <laughs> uh, Two spot, I got to go with Dame Dalla. It's Dame time. Fair shout, fair shout. I wanted to pick him as a Portland Trailblazers fan, but I just wanted to give Luca a little nod. Yeah, because um, Damian Lillard has really, really put that team on his back. Damian Lillard really wants to go somewhere with, with that team. Yeah. Uh, so, and I respect him for it. And so at the forwards, I mean, we all knew this was coming. LeBron James, come on. LeBron James. Easy pick. Um, this is kind of a dark horse candidate, and I really was skeptical about picking him, but, you know, Zion Williamson out of New Orleans. 
I think Zion has been doing really well to keep that team afloat. Uh, they we criticized them a little, or uh, in a, one of the few, one of the other episodes that we had. But I think Zion Williamson is would has the potential to turn that team around and be the the leader there. So, and then at the five center, big man, Joker, Nikola Jokic out of Denver. Easy pick. And who are your three bench guys in the West as well? My three bench guys, I got to go with Luca because I think it was Stephen A. who said he's the best damn white boy I've seen since Larry Bird. Probably true. Actually, no, definitely uh, true. Almost oh, yeah. definitely true. I will say definitely true. Um, I got to give the other spot to Donovan Mitchell, who's on a tear. He's playing really well. That Utah Jazz team is really put together. I mean, we just talked about it, so I don't need to explain to you. And then I got – I don't have Kawhi Leonard. I have Paul George. All right, fair shake, fair shake. Up, he has stepped up his game since last year, and I'm excited to see where that Los Angeles team – goes this year with a new and improved Paul George. Fair shake. All right, my uh, bench guys, I also had uh, Donovan Mitchell as one of my three guys. Uh, he, the way he's leading the guys in Utah, and we talked about it, so good. Uh, you had Luca on your bench. I had him in my starter. You have Dame in your starters. I have Dame on my bench. Easily a top 10 player in the NBA. I just wanted to give a little shout to other guys. Dame Dollar, captain of the Portland Trailblazers. What a, what a great player he is. Um, and then my final bench spot, I actually gave to Devin Booker, the Phoenix Suns. They're have playing very nice basketball. Really, ever since the bubble last year, they've been very, very nice. Pick up the veteran Chris Paul, but it's still Devin Booker's team. He's their leading scorer. He's their main man. He, I think he's going to make a back-to-back All-Star game. Yeah, no, so he's I, playing very, very well. I think Devin Booker has a chance to lead that team to a championship. If they keep building the right way, and he's still youngish, he's like Wally. Isn't he still young? Yeah, he's like, like twenty-four or something. Three years in the league. Yeah. yeah, so he's still. They got still plenty of time to build something special in Phoenix. All right, time to shift it back to where we are in the Eastern Conference. I'll let you All take right. it away. I'll take this one. I got the one, the only Bradley Beal, because you know. That Washington team would not have a name without Bradley Beal. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry for all Washington fans, but Bradley Beal is just an absolute unit, and he's just going to keep doing Bradley Beal things. Go Gators. Uh, The second – my second vote goes to Colin Sexton from Cleveland. Uh, Cleveland is not doing the best because wowza. It's just, I don't know what's happening in Cleveland after LeBron left, but Colin Sexton, he's been playing really well. We all saw what happened in that overtime game against the Nets. Um, So, yeah, I I had to give it to Colin Sexton. It was just a no-brainer. And then at the forwards, I thought, why not give it to one of the most efficient, if not the most efficient, scorers, in the league, Kevin Durant. And that just explains itself. I don't, you don't, I don't need to explain this to you because he's Kevin Durant. Um, and moving on, Julius Randle from the New York Knicks. Wow, that New York Knicks. It's surprising. So Julius Randle and MVP candidate, Joel Embiid at the center. That one also kind of explains itself. He's just been on a tear this season. Easily one of the best big men in the league. He's been staying healthy this year so far. So good things. All right, uh, my starters, it looks very similar. Uh, We have um, three of the same guys. I also gave the respect to Bradley Beal. Uh, And then KD and Joel Embiid, I think it's just easy locks as well. But I did have a different other guard. Instead of Colin Sexton, I went with Trey Young, Atlanta Hawks. That man is like a diet Steph Curry, but that's not even a disrespect to him. He is a playmaker. He makes highlight play after highlight play. He, he, can, he can drop 50 on you any game he wants. He's got the range that he showed in college where he'll just pull up from half court. No, so Trey Young, he's playing really well. I think he makes it to another all-star game. 
And then I did not have Julius Randle in my starting five. I went with the the uh, reigning MVP from the Milwaukee Bucks, Giannis Antetokounmpo. He's still one of the best players. He's not making as much noise. The Bucks aren't quite as good as they were last year, but the man is still the man. Giannis is still an all-star starter for me. All right, you go with your bench. On right, my bench, I actually picked a couple of the dudes you had in your starting five. So the two surprise guys, uh, Julius Randle and Colin Sexton, uh, I think they deserve a fair shake. So they're both on my bench for the reasons you listed. They're just playing very well, kind of carrying surprising teams. And in my third spot, I picked Jalen Brown, Boston Celtics. Boston is a little disappointing as of late. But they're still one of the top five teams in the East. And he's probably their best player. He's their leading scorer for what that's worth. So I picked Jalen Brown as my third uh, third uh, all-star reserve there. You got on your bench. And on my bench, yeah, we kind of just flip flop. Reigning MVP Giannis, like he's he's still playing at the level that he has been playing. Just the Bucks haven't been making that much noise like last year. Trey Young, like you said, electric. Honestly, <laughs> I'm a Papa Jersey for myself. I'm not gonna lie, and I'm not even a Cox fan. Um, and then the last one, last bench goes to Kyrie Irving. Best handles in the league, maybe even in history of the league. So he is a fair claim at the man. He's just got the magic hands. And he's he's probably still the number two there in Brooklyn, even with James Harden there. All right. Well, we promised it last week. Uh, I ran an Instagram poll on our Instagram. Uh, yesterday asking if you guys want us to talk about it uh i believe the votes were nine to one in favor of it so we are talking college basketball for the first time in this show's history i know neither of us are that knowledgeable on the topic but we did a little looking did a little searching and found some things of note so the big storyline that we have to talk about is the incredibly bad season from the big programs those are Kentucky, Duke, and North Carolina. Yeah, these three, like, traditional blue bloods, and not even, like, UCLA and Indiana, sorry, enough, who, like, are traditional blue bloods but have been kind of bad for the past couple years. These three are kind of out of the blue because they've been competitive, like, really recently. But they've completely fallen off, especially Kentucky. Oh, man, 6-13. and 13. They lost to Richmond, the Spiders. They lost to Notre Dame, who I know for a fact are pretty mediocre at best. They got crushed by Bama, who we'll talk about later. So I don't know what's going on, Coach Cal Perry. I think maybe part of it is that they're not getting the top, top recruits anymore because college basketball recruiting has basically changed to guys just go wherever the hell they want. They don't care about going to the best program. So the number one recruit last year, Cade Cunningham, he just went to Oklahoma State because I don't, I don't know why. He went to Oklahoma State. <laughs> And they got other guys going to the G League. So unlike that one year when they had like Carl Anthony Towns, Devin Booker, like a bunch of NBA top prospects, they're kind of they're kind of reeling a little bit. And the guys they do have aren't ready to make that impact right away. So Kentucky's flailing, Duke's flailing. They're not even on the bubble. They're at 500. They lost to Notre Dame last week. They lost to Carolina last week. They did beat North Carolina State this past Saturday, but they're at 500. They're reeling. And then their uh, tobacco road rivals, North Carolina, are only slightly better. They're barely on the bubble. So I know, I know. again, we don't know that much about college basketball. How shocking is it to you to see these traditional power programs in the dumps like this? Yeah, it's just, it's just very awkward because they've, they've been dominating ever since, like, ever since I was born, I'm pretty sure, right? Yeah. I mean, there's no way that – they're, they're just I just can't believe that this is happening right now. So, I mean, I think they've all won national titles in like the last decade. You know, yeah, it's it's wild how fast they, and how weird it is. I guess like COVID obviously plays a part in it, and all the other weird stuff on the outside. But to see all these power programs at the same time just floundering, it's it's truly bizarre. And I know it makes a. I was talking to my dad the other day. He was talking about how just uninterested he is in college basketball because. None of like these big teams are there anymore. It's all, it's it's all a bunch of weird guys. And on that note, I want to talk about some of these surprise teams, right? And when I think of surprises in college basketball, they've fallen off in the past, in the past week or so. They're not as high as they were, 
but they're still one of the best teams. Somehow, some way, Alabama has become a dual threat school. Yeah. <laughs> they won the national championship in football, and now they're t- on a tear in basketball since since when? Like, come on. They're the top team in the SEC this year, somehow. Uh, they're 12 and 1 in conference play. They're projected right now by Joe Lenardi as a two seed in the tournament. Alabama. And they don't even have Colin Sexton like they did that one time. Yeah. It's wild. It, it baffles me. Uh, what, I, they're 17 and 5. Yeah. It's, they're playing great ball. I, I know they've taken a little bit dip recently. I think they lost a couple games, but. <laughs> I mean, they're still world. They they could win the SEC. They could be a one seed in the NCAA tournament. Alabama basketball, men's basketball. My brain does not compute. And then there's a couple other big yeah, football, a couple other big football programs out there. Right? What? Big Ten schools. Yeah, these these Big Ten schools that aren't yours. <laughs> you went there, didn't you? You really had to go there. Yes, so the, all the Big Ten schools not named Indiana, they're killing it. Hey, <laughs> bounce back. We're going to bounce back, okay? Next year, next year, root for IU. Go Hoosiers. But in all seriousness, uh, Ohio State, uh, Very they, they, they're, they're third in the conference, but they're projected as a one seed. They've beaten Purdue a couple times. I'm actually, sorry, excuse me, they lost to Purdue a couple times, but they beat Illinois, who are another good team. Iowa coming came into the season as the best team in the Big Ten because they have Luke Garza, who's pretty widely regarded as the best player in college basketball. Man, I remember that loss that we had to Illinois. <laughs> oh, it was it was terrible. It was like seventy eight to seventy five in overtime. Oh no, it just hurt. It just hurt. I mean, that would have been a big big win because Illinois are also one of these elite teams in the Big Ten this year. Um, They've only lost a couple games in uh, they think those two out of conference losses, but they lost to Baylor, who are undefeated top two team, and Missouri, who are the number two team in the SEC. So Illinois, they're also great. And then the other team in the Big Ten who's actually leading the conference right now is Michigan. They're I think 15 and one. Jawan Howard in second year. Quote me if I'm wrong, somebody. Uh, Jawan Howard, he's leading the way. Uh, to be fair though. They haven't won any big games yet. They haven't played very many big teams yet. But this weekend, the game, basketball edition, Ohio State, Michigan, having great seasons, both projected one seeds right now. Huge college basketball game. So if you're into college hoops, this is a must-watch game. Uh, so a lot of Big Ten stuff is going to be decided there. And these, these so these, uh, yeah, just fun to see these Big Ten programs. They're kind of taking the mantle of the fallen – ACC programs here, but I have it also in the notes here. We'd be reluctant if we didn't mention the two kings of this sport right now by quite a ways, Gonzaga and Baylor. You know how many games they've lost combined? None. None. They are combined 37 and nothing. They also have good wins. I mean, they've beaten ranked teams. They like beat Baylor beat Illinois. Iowa, Kansas. They beat West uh, Virginia. They, yeah, that's Gonzaga. true. Uh, Baylor beat Texas, who are a top 10 team. They also beat Illinois, like yeah. you said. Earlier. Which makes it so sad that in December, also, right? in December, they were supposed to play each other. Yeah. I, I think that was one of those tournaments, if I'm not mistaken. It was one of those like uh, weird early season tournaments that they tried to do even with COVID because the people who scheduled college basketball have no sense. Um, but yeah, so how good would that game have been, huh? I mean, these teams are on a tear. Although Gonzaga makes me sad because one of their starting players, uh, Andrew Nemhard, former Florida Gator, and he transferred away. Sad. But good for him doing well with Gonzaga. All right, well, we're at that point in the podcast where I'm not going to say anything. College Hoops is over. We're college hoops, well, not over, but we're done with that section. This is all Topher talking about lacrosse. Topher, I'll be back in a few minutes. 
All right. So oh. as he mentioned, we're talking lacrosse right now. Um, there's another, there's a big news that I'm sure everybody saw, regardless if you're a lacrosse fan or not, but I don't want to talk about that right now. Right? I want to talk about the attackman abundance we have in lacrosse right now. There are so many good offensive players in the PLL and the coming over from the MLL, so many good players in college right now. So I'm, it's, it's honestly crazy to me, the sheer volume of talent at the attack position we have right now in 2021. So if we just focus on college right now, so Michael Sowers is a top 10 player basically in the history of college lacrosse, certainly recently, the past four ish years. If he broke the Princeton single season scoring record three times in a row, he's top 10 in all time points. He came to Duke and immediately turned them from a fringe contender to the unquestioned number one team in the country. But I, it's hard to say if he's even the best attackman in his own conference, in his own state anymore, because Chris Gray, the former Boston transfer at North Carolina, has been arguably probably the best player in all of college across through the first couple games of the season here. Uh, he's, he's making highlight play after highlight play. He had that nasty backhand goal. Um, yeah, there's so many good attackmen in college lacrosse. It'll be interesting to see how this affects the pro game because that's that's my favorite. That's more that's my specialty, my my knowledge hub, if you will. Um, we see it, we're already seeing the shuffling. Uh, Atlas trading Rob Pinnell to the Redwoods for an entry draft pick. Um, so. Are they going to take Michael Sowers? We all assume that, but now we're seeing Chris Gray. He's putting on a show. Could they draft him instead? Maybe they don't want an attackman from college at all. Maybe they want to go after a guy in the entry draft. Uh, they want Randy Stotts or Tommy Palasek or Bryce Wasserman from the Boston Cannons. He was the MVP of the MLL last year. Maybe they want to trade up and get Lyle somehow, some way. I don't doubt. I don't think that's possible, but you get, you get the point. There's so much shuffling that needs to happen right now. And... As we approach the PLL entry draft, PLL collegiate draft, the rest of the college season, all this stuff, it, it's where guys land is so fascinating to me because there are so few spots now. And there's so many players that can play. It's it's a treat. I don't know how defenses are going to catch up, to be honest with you. Um, and then the other news, the news that's pretty unavoidable if you follow lacrosse is Chris Hogan, former Patriots wide receiver, uh, has signed with the PLL, joined the entry draft. It's very interesting news. It's very exciting news. It's very big news, frankly. It, it, I mean, the Premier Lacrosse League was mentioned on ESPN's homepage for the first time pretty much ever. I, I mean, as someone who's trying to grow the game here, grow a professional game as more of a mainstream entity, I, I can't help but love to see that. But I'd be remiss if I didn't share my negative aspects to this, is that Chris Hogan hasn't played lacrosse in like 12 years at a, at a high level. And even then, Penn State wasn't where they are now as a top five program in the country. They were much, much lower on that pecking order. And he was a captain there. He was all conference there. So it's not like he's a complete sh schlub who was much better at football. He was a good lacrosse player who chose to play football for a long time. So the there is talent there, no doubt. But I question if he will actually be worthy of a spot heading forward in the PLL. I mean, he wasn't even the best attackman, or excuse me, one of the he wasn't even the best midfielder signed to the PLL that weekend from a Big Ten school. I don't even know if he's the most athletic midfielder signed to the PLL from a Big Ten school this past weekend. Because Mikey Schlosser, coming over from the Denver Outlaws via the University of Michigan a few years ago, uh, he's been one of the best midfielders in pro lacrosse for a couple of years. So while Chris Hogan, I mean, Chris Hogan, he's going to get a shot because he's Chris Hogan. He's a part-time invest. He's a part investor of the league. He's a, probably the biggest name in the league because of his football career. Uh, I mean, I mean, Neff here, I mean, he, he knows who Chris Hogan is. I don't know how many other lacrosse players he can name other than Chris Hogan. You know what I mean? So there's a place for him in this league at, from a marketing perspective, but I do worry he will have a greater opportunity than a guy like Schlosser, like some of the rookies coming out of college to make get a roster spot because of his name recognition. All right. That's all I have to share about lacrosse right now. Uh, I will be writing a ton about lacrosse in the coming weeks, sunshine state lacrosse, my blog. Uh, if you don't know about it, I mean, follow up, follow me at sunshine state lacrosse, sunshine state lacrosse.wordpress.com is my blog. Uh, plenty, plenty of stuff to come. And of course I'll keep talking about it on the podcast. Cause that's the sport I love to talk about more than anything. 
Welcome back, Neff. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to get into some football. Yeah, let's get into some football. JJ Watt. Completely oh, disrespected. What does everyone think? No, it wasn't disrespected. They just released him. He said, hey, can I get released? And they released him. What do you think? Oh, excuse me. He wasn't disrespected. Deshaun Watson was disrespected. He was, yeah. And no, I think this. JJ Watt, Watt said, hey, can I get a release, please? And they were like, yeah, sure, JJ. <laughs> like, the face of their franchise is now gone. He's gone for the past, what, 17 years? No, no, that's less than that. It's been like the past decade, though. So you're talking like, like 2010 or something. Oh, 11 years, probably. Yeah, something like that. The past decade, J.J. Watt has been the man in Houston. Hey, and you got to give him props because, you know, he has done so much, not just for the team, but for the community. He has... His, uh, his fundraiser after Hurricane Harvey raised over $34 million. It really helped the community, and it... I mean, I'm surprised he didn't win Walter Payton Man of the Year. I think he did that year, actually. Really? Yeah. He was definitely one of the finalists, but I think he actually won it that year. But what J.J. Watt means to the city of Houston and to the Houston Texans organization is is monumental. Yeah. I mean, the Texans have only been around since, like, 2003. He is the best player and the face of that franchise, their history. They, he is He is the Texans. And yeah, they have other great players, Andre Johnson, Arian Foster, whatever. He is the Houston Texans, and that is gone now. So that's that's kind of a shock. Yeah. That's, a, that's a shock, like, foundational move. Well, Obviously, really, he, he's not he, as good as he was, but still, it's a big move. But, um, you know, I think I think what he did with the, the video he released, he said no to press conferences and, you know, video calls from reporters he said no i'm gonna tell my city he he refers to houston as my city which is the most respectful thing that i've ever noticed in in a player in nfl football um he showed them so much love so much respect so much he he bled sweat and cried for that team so you know respect to J.J. Watt, and I hope he can manage to go somewhere where they're, they'll take care of him as well as he is taken care of. So, yeah, hopefully he can find a family that will take him in. Yeah, on that, on that note, um, I see this as not J.J. Watt wanting to leave Houston. It's J.J. Watt wanting to leave the Texans because they have no immediate future. And they are one of the worst run organizations in professional sports. I mean, every player has basically said it who's come through the Texans. I mean, I, I mentioned Arian Foster and Andre Johnson. They've both said nothing but negative, really, about the Texans as an organization. And then, of yeah. course, they're holding the Sean Watson hostage at this point. Mm -hmm. So, fair shot to him for leaving. And right, where, where is he going? Where's he going? We got, we got to talk about where's he going? Well, people think he's going to, people think his brother TJ tweeted, he's like, let's get the brother duo, you know? But uh, I see more realistic situations, him going to Los Angeles, Chargers. I could see that. Um, maybe Washington. Mm -hmm. Maybe get him on the other side of Chase Young, but like, oh my goodness, that would. Just that continue would, to stack their defensive line. They're rich, get richer. You think Chase Young would give up his 99 number just for J.J. Ooh, Watt? Interesting, interesting. I don't know. That'd be a tough shout. Because, I mean, he is the J.J. Watt. I mean, honestly, he is probably like a top five defensive end in NFL history, right? Up there with like Reggie White and, and such. So, I mean. Joe Green. Oh, no, he's a D tackle. Never mind. Yep. He's not a but yeah, um, those are fair, fair, fair shots. I definitely don't like Pittsburgh. I like Pittsburgh for the outside stuff. It's just fun. Yeah, it would be fun to have JJ Watt play with TJ Watt. That'd just be fun. I mean, he, he, it would be JJ, TJ, and Derek all on yeah. the Steelers. So for that factor, it would be very fun. But I just don't like the, the schematic fit. He's, also, he's, I, I don't think he would 
fit well in the defense that they run. Yeah, he's too big to be like their outside linebacker like TJ, but he's also too small to be their inside guy like Stephon Tuitt. So he just doesn't fit their style, unfortunately. Uh, let's see, what's a – I mean, he could stay in the division and come to Indy, but <laughs> I, doubt, I doubt that's just going to happen. I mean, it would be great because, you know, we already got the fourth Buckner. Mm-hmm. I mean, he would he would help out any team. I know he's not defense player of the year anymore, but he's still a good player. I, he would be a great. You, you said the Chargers, right? The Chargers, yeah, because they got Joey Bosa on the right. So yeah, I, I could definitely see him going out west. I, I have a feeling he's gonna want to find his way out west, either with the Chargers, the Rams, if they somehow have magic money hiding somewhere. I don't think he's gonna sign with the Rams. I don't think uh, I think they already maybe, have. Um, maybe, Maybe San Francisco. Pair with um, Nick Bosa. Well, Nick Bo- they could move Nick Bosa, but I think Nick Bosa is comfortable at his position right now. No, no, play him opposite Nick Bosa. On the other end. That's true. Because JJ JJ can come from either way. Like Yeah. Or or you can just um, trade Nick Bosa for Deshaun Watson. Big brain move. And then get JJ Watt as a less good replacement. Hyperbrain, thousand IQ play. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that'll be fun to see where JJ Watt ends up going. It's it's just gonna be weird to see him in a he'll stay uniform in, other than that blue and red. He'll stay in the AFC. Eh, it depends who comes calling. Hello, help out that defense. Help out Buffalo. That'd be fun. I'd like to see that. They got they got who? Tremaine Edwards. Yeah, they they got Ed Oliver on the inside. And they got Micah Hyde with Tredavious White. and They got a good young defense. They could use another experienced, talented guy on there. All right. I feel like we're obligated to talk some more quarterback stuff because that's how it is. I think we can skip Deshaun Watson, right? Yeah. we. I mean, if from the way it looks, unless something happens, like someone makes an offer, like that's not – nothing's going to happen there. He's going to be held hostage. He's Eventually, at some point, he's probably going to have to cave and just play for the Texans even though he doesn't want to. Or it's hold out. Reigns to be seen. Nothing ha- has happened with Wentz this past week. Yeah, no, that was surprising. I was, I was very sure that he was either going to go to Indy or he was going to go to um... – Chi-Town. Or but – People think he was going to go to New England, but pff, Bill Belichick doesn't want Carson Wentz. <laughs> no. Yeah, so I, just, I think it's just the, a team like Indy, I think they want him, but the Eagles want too much in return. And the team trading for him, they don't have to trade for him. It's, he's the Eagles' problem more than he is theirs. So if the Eagles don't lower their asking price, he might just sit there and be the most expensive backup quarterback in the NFL. Uh, there's the other name. He's technically a free agent. He's probably going to get franchise tag, but I think it's an interesting thing to discuss is Dak Prescott. Yeah, they, they left him out of it, uh, out of the hype video for the Dallas Cowboy. Uh, you see that video I sent you of, um, I think it was Dominique Foxworth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, gosh, that was so good. Was but, I mean, he, he makes a good point. Dak Prescott is that entire team. He really is, like, and even with Dak Prescott, they were playing so bad. I think Dak Prescott should ask for Adam Dallas. He, I, I mean, he just deserves my, he deserves good money for one. He deserves a good contract. Money, he deserves a good team because sure. Dallas has weapons, but they don't know how to manage those weapons. And their offensive line is getting older. When 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 Jerry Jones retired, or like. Hopefully, like Jerry Jones can get out of there soon because that Dallas team really needs some help. Yeah. I saw I saw something the other day that said they should permanently move the Super Bowl to Dallas so that they can avoid any home field advantage from any team ever again. <laughs> uh, we all joke about the Cowboys never winning a Super Bowl, but there's nothing that indicates they will ever be that competitive right now. Yeah, I mean it's not like it's not like they have a Roger Staubach with Michael. Wait, they did they did did they play together? No, no, no. Staubach was like the '60s. Yeah, yeah you're talking. You're thinking Troy Aikman. I'm thinking Troy Aikman with Mike Irvin. Yeah. They have Dak Prescott, who's a better quarterback than Troy Aikman. Oh, I said it. Someone get mad. 
Dak Prescott, he's, he's a easily a top 10 quarterback. Sometimes he plays like a top five quarterback. Why they are pussyfooting around giving him top five quarterback money is beyond. He had more passing yards than like five quarterbacks in the league. And he hadn't played since week five, and it was already like week 10. Like, yeah. did you see that stat where they kept doing every single week? They were like, Dak Prescott hasn't played since last week or two weeks ago or three weeks ago, and he still has more passing yards this year than some of these quarterbacks. Yeah. I don't know why they won't give him the money. Uh, the really cynical part of me thinks it's because Jerry Jones is a racist piece of garbage and Dak Prescott's a black quarterback. That's the really cynical part of me. I don't, I hope that's not the reason. I really hope. I hope it's just that they're a terribly run organization that doesn't know what they're doing, which is probably more accurate. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't rely on Texas right now with their well, sports organizations. Oh, gosh. Houston Rockets, Houston Texans. Now the Dallas Cowboys are bad and love Dak Prescott out of the hype video. <laughs> <laughs> the Astros with the World Series. Oh, Houston, Texas sports are a train wreck. Um, I'm trying to think, is there a bright spot? If you follow hockey, let me know if the stars are good. I mean, Dallas, even the Mavericks, they're playing so bad right now. They have Luka busting his ass off, and he, he there are no results. No results. They did, they did not pay for the depth on that team. And Texas sports right now are just a train wreck i have one counter to that there is one team in texas who is making only positive vibes if you say a lacrosse team i will no austin football club the new mls expansion team set the start play in april they got the fancy new stadium they've got a couple of fun exciting designated player signings they have a cool uniform with the green and black stripes. Matthew McConaughey is involved, so it's a good epic meme. That's the only team in Texas I can think of that's only positive energy right now. <laughs> the I only, guess maybe FC Dallas, but they don't win ever, so no. The only good team that I could think of that was good in, in Texas was the Houston Roughnecks. <laughs> <laughs> Walker at the, at the helm. They have, they're probably the most successful team in Texas. In recent years, at least. What? In recent years, at least. Because, I mean, Dallas went far last year in the, the playoffs. The Mavericks. No, not, not really. All right. Let's maybe not dunk on. Let's stop dunking on Texas. Hey, real note. People in Texas, stay safe. That weather's wicked. It's like negative 16 in Texas. Did you see the... I don't mean to bring up stuff that isn't sports, but did you see the 100 car pile up that happened in Texas? Yeah, I mean, it's I bad. Know we, we jokingly make fun of Texas, but hey, hope you guys are staying safe because this is some some bad stuff going on. All right, we have another joking thing, so we can swerve back into more fun things. This is not NFL related, but it's very funny. <laughs> the University of Central Florida hired their new head coach to replace Josh Heupel. Naf, I think you should reveal to the people who they hired. <clears> they <throat> revealed the one, the only, the a coach from Auburn, Gus Malzahn. <laughs> this is such a weird hire. I mean, yeah. It's just weird. Also, I just realized this now. UCF beat Gus Malzahn in a BCS bowl game. Well, not be a uh, New Year's Six Bowl game a couple years ago when UCF was national champions. So I think this makes this extra funny. Also, Gus Malzahn's been like a meme for three years, and Auburn fans have been begging for him to get fired, and then they fired him. And UCF's like, yes, 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 please. Give me that fired Auburn coach. <laughs> UCF is like a UCF is like a hungry child wanting more food for soccer practice. Yeah, I mean, to, to be respectful here, he did lead Auburn to a national championship game. He's had very several good seasons at they Auburn. National championship game, too. They didn't quite win one, but they, they played Florida State once in a championship oh, yeah. game. 
Yeah. Um, they almost made the playoff another time. They made a couple of New Year's Six games. They beat Alabama a couple times. And then they recruited Bo Nix and put him in starting quarterback. <laughs> Auburn, they have issues, but Gus Malzahn, he's a good coach. And the big thing with them is they didn't want to hire a young coach because they didn't want a coach to take this job and then jump ship the way Josh Heupel did, the way Scott Frost did. So I think maybe the reason they hired Gus Malzahn, who's he's a yes, he's a retread coach. He's a little like a, he doesn't really fit what you'd expect. I think it's because they have a feeling he's just going to be here for the long haul. Mm-hmm. And then I also have another note about the schematic fit of Gus Malzahn with UCF. Gus Malzahn's offense is like a spread run. They like to run the hell out of the ball at their best. They are basically army level of trip, triple option sometimes, which is very disappointing for UCF because they have the best passing offense like in the South, basically. Certainly in the group of five. And they have probably one of they have a top three quarterback in college football in Dylan Gabriel. So I hope he not finds a way to fix his offense to match what they do. What was that? Uh, top three quarterback, question mark? Yes, he's a top three returning quarterback in college football. Okay. I stand by it. I stand by it. You the Hawaii don't. kid. All right, buddy. All right. Do you have anything else you want to add about Gus Malzahn to UCF? Um, I mean, no, I think it was a good hire. I mean, even though we clown him for – the crap that's gone down at Auburn in recent years. I think what you said, it's, a, it's for the long haul. I mean, if he stays, then good for UCF. Because, uh, uh, you know, not too many people were in line yeah. just for the UCF head coaching job. So, <clears throat> so I think we're going to move on to our playmakers all right, I just want to give some shout here. Last week, we uh, had our poll on Twitter. You lot voted Tom Brady as your playmaker of the week last week for his Super Bowl performance. Why? Why would you do that? You nominated him. I did, but I was <laughs> expecting for people to vote for him. Like, it's Tom Brady. Everyone hates him. Come on. All right, so Tom Brady was last week's playmaker of the week. He joins Nikola Jokic in our Playmaker Hall of Fame here. After we after we've nominated ten, we're gonna split it up into five, and five, and then we'll see who the playmaker. Oh no, no, you know what we're gonna do, is that, like midway once we get to like, thirty two. Thirty two winners. Oh, a bracket. Thirty two winners. We're gonna do a bracket. So stay tuned in for in a couple months. We're gonna do our playmaker bracket. That'll probably be at the end of season one of the playmakers podcast yeah so stay with us we got only good stuff coming all right so i'm gonna i started last week so i'm gonna let you start who are your two playmakers of the week all right well my first playmaker of the week comes from the premier league his name is ilke uh i have trouble saying his name but guan uh gondwan ilkai gundwan ilkai gundwan like how Topher says it this dude is insane. 14 goals since January, right? Something um, like that. He's, yeah, I think he's the leading scorer in all of the Premier League since January. He's a midfielder? Correct. So I think that's, that's insane. That's, if you have more than 10 goals as a midfielder, you're insane. And that's just, since, that's just in the past, like, two months. Yeah. <laughs> so props to him. He's been playing some amazing football or soccer. Um, and my second playmaker of the week is someone who doesn't really get the recognition he deserves, and that is De'Aaron Fox of the Sacramento Kings, because he has been ecstatic this season. Those Kings, how about them Kings, baby? Let's go. You know, it's about time. It is about time. Sack Towner back, baby. And De'Aaron so, Fox is leading that charge. De'Aaron, I mean, it's not only him, but give massive props to De'Aaron Fox. I'm pretty sure he's been there the longest out of that group. I mean, he's been there for like f- almost five years now, I think. Yeah. So yeah, fair shout. Mm-hmm. All right. I went a different direction this week with my playmakers of the week. So this first one, 
don't don't bash me here because it's technically not one player because I didn't know who to signal out for this ridiculous feat. But Oklahoma University softball. They're playing UTEP in their season opener and they win 29 to nothing and hit a record 13 home runs in five innings. There are plenty of players who did well in that game, but I'm just going to shout out whole Oklahoma women's softball team. They just absolutely beat the hell out of a couple teams this past week here. I mean, they won all four of their games and the closest one won by like six runs. Unreal stuff. It's good job. Good job, folks, over at Oklahoma. Then my last playmaker of the week here, it's lacrosse because, of course, it is. I will have a lacrosse playmaker of the week every week that there's lacrosse. I wanted to pick Ryan Tierney of Hofstra. He had, I think, eight goals and three assists, but they lost. You know who had that many points and didn't lose was Izzy Skeen of Northwestern women's lacrosse. She had nine goals and three assists and an absolute drubbing of not the Ohio State. 23 to seven. So Izzy Skein and Oklahoma softball are my playmakers of the week for episode four. Anything else you want to add before we get out of here? Uh, listen, I know we say this every single week and we're going to continue to say it, but every view, every like that we get, we 100% appreciate it. It's not, it's not easy to start up a podcast like this from the ground and Every single view that I see get on these videos, it's monumental to me. So it means a lot. And I, I know it means the same to Topher because 100%, 100%. we worked so hard on this. Mm -hmm. And we really thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch or listen to us, whatever platform you're on. Yeah. And I, um, I just want to remind folks uh, where they can find us all. So this is going to be a long spiel here. We are on Twitter, at The Playmakers. Uh, we are on Instagram. I don't remember what the caption is, but I think it, it is on the video here. I'll also link it in the Spotify description. Uh, we are on YouTube, the Playmakers Podcast with Neff and Topher, if you choose to watch there. We are available on Spotify. We are available on, I believe, Anchor as well, unless Anchor doesn't have their own Spotify or own platform anymore. But that's where you can find us and listen to us. Hit us up with questions, um, comments. If there's something you want to see change, you want us to talk about a specific topic, just let us know. We care about what you guys have to say. I mean, as much as this is us talking about what we want to talk about, we want to know what everybody else is interested in as well here. So all the support helps. It means the world to us. Um, yeah, so thank you all, everybody. Also, um, oh, man, I totally blanked on what I was going to say. I'll, oh, we're on episode four. So soon we will, we will still have the normal episodes every week. But we're going to try to release little shorts each week, depending on breaking news and stuff like that. Maybe like three, three to 10 minute segments at the most. So, you know, yeah, a, lot of, a lot of exciting stuff happening. So just keep following us, follow us along. We'll try and post more, be a little more active. We're, we're, a lot of fun stuff is coming your way. That's for sure. All right. Well, thank you for tuning into this episode of the Playmakers podcast. Uh, this has been quite an awesome video i really enjoyed this one yeah this was might have been my favorite to be honest yeah because we talked about lacrosse like. <laughs> <laughs> um please tune in next week for the next episode of the playmakers podcast we might have a guest question mark Ooh. all right bye everybody bye everyone mm -hmm.